Hey there, mitochondriacs. It's Dr. People again for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. Today, we're going to continue our journey talking about mitochondrial dynamics, in particular, fission and fusion events. And so what happens when things go wrong? What happens when mitochondrial fission and fusion are imbalanced? How do metabolic diseases such as diabetes, obesity, cause mitochondrial dynamics dysfunction? And how does the mitochondrial dynamics dysfunction continue and perpetuate metabolic disease? What types of mitochondrial dynamic dysfunction is often seen in cancer? Those are the type of questions we're going to try to answer today in today's video. So stay tuned. Okay. So as we talked about the last time when we were talking about the overview of mitochondrial dynamics, we talked about a process called fission. And fission is going to be when you take one mitochondria and split it into two mitochondria. And under normal physiologic conditions, fission events can help the cell maintain energy metabolism and ATP production. It can help, especially with quality control. It also is important for when there is cell division that the mitochondria gets split evenly so that they can go to their respective daughter cells. It's also important for calcium homeostasis. However, under pathology or under disease-like conditions, it's going to impair mitochondrial energy production. It's going to lead to excess oxidative stress, which will increase inflammation, and it can lead to apoptosis or programmed cell death and necrosis of cells, uncontrolled cell death. So what basically we have is we have nutrients coming in, and that's under the auspices here of glucose. It's going to go through glycolysis, and it's going to end up as pyruvate. Pyruvate is going to enter into the mitochondria of the TCA cycle. And depending on if we have a nutrient excess or a dietary or caloric excess, it's going to lead to excess fission events, and it's going to increase reactive oxygen species. And that's going to lead to an imbalance of mitochondrial dynamics, fission fusion events, which leads to mitochondrial dysfunction. And then excess oxidative stress will also lead to mitochondrial dysfunction. And both of these will contribute to metabolic diseases. And I know this is a cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease lecture, but as we can see, see these metabolic diseases such as obesity, such as type 2 diabetes, these are precancerous conditions. So you can see that this lays the groundwork for future precancerous state, which can lead to a full diagnosis of cancer in the future. So what are some of the molecular mechanisms that lead to this problem? I'm going to start with excess fission events. So when we are in a nutrient excess, caloric excess, a hyperglycemic situation, we're going to decrease or block AMP kinase, and that's going to then decrease the ability for mitochondria to fuse. We're going to have excess insulin production as well as IGF-1 production. And then we're also going to signal downstream mTOR, which is a pro-growth signaling cascade or pathway, which is going to drive us towards premature aging, obesity, diabetes, and in this case, it's talking about cardiomyopathy, which is a, another way of saying heart failure. However, on the other end of the spectrum, and I don't like the word starvation here, but the bottom line is when you're in calorie restriction, when you're eating less than your body burns, or if you're fasting, intermittent fasting, if you're in a ketosis type situation, then AMP kinase will be increased. It will allow for mitochondrial fusion, insulin, and insulin like growth factor one will also be decreased, and that will lead to increased fusion. mTOR will be downregulated, and that will lead to increased fusion. And when you have more fusion in general than fission, then that's going to lead to longevity, better glucose tolerance, and an overall healthier metabolic situation. This is a very interesting diagram, and it's painting a very similar picture to what we saw in the last slide. But basically, when we have obesity and aging, we are going to tip the scales more towards fission. As you can see here, these fission-related proteins, DRP1, are upregulated, which leads to more mitochondrial fission. And then the proteins that are required for fusion, mitofusion 2, OPA1, they're downregulated and blocked, and therefore fusion doesn't happen. And when you have less fusion, we have an increase in depolarization of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Basically, there's not enough charge or redox power, as Jack Cruz talks about, on the inner mitochondrial membrane. The proton gradient is not as strong, and that leads to inner energy shortfalls, energy production issues, excess reactive oxygen species. And that's what we're seeing here. When we have excess fission, where we're going to produce excess oxidative stress, reactive oxygen species, the mitochondria will swell and the crystal will become disorganized and dysfunctional. Super complex formation will become decreased. And we're overall going to have a energy deficit, bioenergetic decline, excess oxidative stress, inflammation, which is going to lead us to diseases and really is becomes a vicious snowball where the obesity leads to this mitochondrial dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction leads more to poor energy transformation, energetic decline, more inflammation, more insulin resistance, and more weight gain. So we definitely want to be able to break this vicious cycle. And we're going to talk about how we can do that 
in the coming videos. So reactive oxygen species and mitochondrial dynamics, the yin and yang of mitochondrial dysfunction and cancer progression. And what it says here is that aberrant mitochondrial morphology may lead to enhanced ROS formation, reactive oxygen species, which in turn may deteriorate mitochondrial health and further exacerbate oxidative stress in a perpetual vicious cycle. Here, we review the latest findings on the intricate relationship between mitochondrial dynamics, ROS production, and focusing mainly on its role in malignant disease or cancer. And this paper titled Therapeutic Potential of Targeting Mitochondrial Dynamics in Cancer. And what it says here is, interestingly, there is a growing evidence proposing that tumor cells modifying the mitochondrial dynamics, rheostat, in order to gain proliferative and survival advantages. Increased mitochondrial fission has been reported in several types of cancer, human cancers, melanoma, ovarian, breast cancer, lung, thyroid, glioblastoma, brain cancer, and others. And some studies have reported possible direct correlation between increased mitochondrial fusion and chemo resistance of tumor. So this is what I was talking about, how it's not exactly black and white, although I do think it is not quite gray either. I think you're going to see as I lay out that there's probably definite advantages to being, if you're going to have to, to pick one side, either fusion or fission, fission is fission is probably the more dangerous of the two. Fusion seems to be a more safe situation, although in studies, as you'll see, there is kind of a catch-22 with both. And that's what we're going to see here in this slide here. So as you can see, fission is going to lead to a fragmentation of mitochondria, a splitting of mitochondria, and that's going to increase cells' reliance on glycolysis. Remember, that's more like the Warburg effect, Warburg metabolism. It's going to decrease oxidative phosphorylation or the reliance on making ATP through the electron transport chain. And it's going to, in theory, decrease reactive oxygen species overall. And the reason that that's, this seems very confusing because we've talked about in the last two slides how mitochondrial fission can lead to increased reactive oxygen species, that's if mitophagy is working. Because ultimately, fission is a quality control mechanism when it's not related to cell division. And it should end in mitophagy, which is the recycling of damaged mitochondria. So that is the goal of trying to decrease oxidative stress. However, in a lot of cancers, mitophagy can either be upregulated pathologically or downregulated pathologically. And so I believe in this slide, it should be kind of a, an equal sign because it could increase reactive oxygen species overall, or it could decrease reactive oxygen species overall, depending on the type of cancer and depending on the level of mitophagy or mitochondrial specific autophagy going on in that particular cancer type. And that's going to, in general, lead to migration and metastases. And it's generally metastatic disease or metastases where cancer spreads to other part of the body that actually kills patients, not necessarily tumor burden. So this is why I believe that probably if you're going to pick one of the two, fusion is probably better. As you can see, when there's excess fusion and, and cancer, it's going to decrease glycolysis, it's going to increase reliance on oxidative phosphorylation, but it's also, in this case, going to block mitophagy and it's going to increase reactive oxygen species because potentially damaged mitochondria that are fused together pathologically or disease in a disease state like cancer is going to exhibit more reactive oxygen species than normally. And because in this case, mitophagy is pathologically or diseased and not functioning correctly, then the damaged oxidative stress producing mitochondria cannot undergo recycling and there is an excess of reactive oxygen species. So this is this is where the gray area starts because when we're talking about disease prevention, we definitely want probably more fusion than fission and we definitely want autophagy to be going on and mitophagy going on. When we're talking about cancer, it's not quite as clear. Again, here is a normal cell. We have fission and fusion that are kind of equal. And then in cancer cells, we have increased proliferation, metastases, cancer stem cell maintenance. And that's when fusion is grossly outweighing fission and there's an, an imbalance toward fusion. And then when there's an imbalance towards fission, it's going to be resistance to apoptosis because there's increased mitophagy, proliferation. Essentially, cancer can hijack mitochondrial fission or fusion for its own purposes, which leaves us as the clinician, but also as the learner and the patient, hopefully not, but maybe confused and without a clear way to move forward forward. And I empathize with that. So this slide is talking about how aberrant signaling in cancer leads to excess fission events. It does seem as I've went through the literature that although we've seen slides where there can be excess fusion in cancer and excess fission in cancer, it does seem in general that fission seems to be the more dangerous of the two. And a lot of the pictures that we're seeing here where there's excess hepatocyte growth factors and epidermal growth factors and RTKs, receptor tyrosine 
kinases and they're activating fission and increasing migration, invasion, and metastases, which is definitely what truly makes cancer dangerous is when it invades other tissues and when it spreads to other parts of the body. That's definitely what makes cancer more dangerous and is likely to lead to a demise to a patient is metastatic disease. And so I do believe that from my reading of the literature that excess fission in cancer is probably more dangerous and it would be beneficial to employ therapeutics that help with blocking excess mitochondrial fission, but we will continue on. So again, another slide showing that when there's mitochondrial dysfunction, there's excess ROS production, and then there's likely excess mitochondrial fission events, which leads to cell motility, invasion to local structures and tissues, and ultimately metastases, which leads to a stage four cancer event, which is definitely more dangerous. This is just a slide talking about how various imbalances and fission infusion lead to different cancer dynamics and cancer behavior, whether or not the anti-tumor effects, whether it be anti-apoptosis, whether it be drug resistance, whether it be cancer stem cells, angiogenesis, metastases, and growth and infiltration into other tissues. I know that I, in the last video, prefaced that when it comes to mitochondrial dynamics and disease prevention, it's fairly clear which is the more beneficial. Having healthy amounts of mitophagy, having a good balance, definitely fission would be the more dangerous and fusion would be the more longevity promoting and health promoting. But in cancer, it's not quite as clear. And I understand that. And I'm sorry that if it was confusing, I do think that cancer does add a level of complexity to mitochondrial dynamics that makes it difficult to explain and also give solid recommendations about how to move forward with that. If I had to add my own personal and professional commentary to this, I would say that I would address the Warburg metabolism, the hypoxia and pseudo hypoxia to shut off cancer metabolism ultimately. And then once I was healthy, I would probably worry more about the mitochondrial dynamics portion of it, reducing heteroplasmy and so on and so forth. And in the next video, we're going to tackle the topic of mitophagy. And again, mitophagy is one of those where under health conditions or under less severe disease conditions, it's fairly clear what we want in terms of mitophagy and autophagy. But in cancer, again, it can be a catch-22 and a little bit more of a gray area. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you like the video, please like it, share, subscribe, and until next time.